Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's very exciting installment of our Lunch Bites series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society. And we're thrilled that so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to join us and learn a bit about this fascinating and important figure in capital history and indeed American history. Uh, before we get started with today's program, I'd like to go over a couple of brief technical housekeeping matters. Uh, one of the ways we love to use this Zoom webinar platform to engage with your audience while we can't gather in person is through the question and answer feature. So as we proceed through today's webinar, if you have any questions for our beloved Steve Livengood, our, our resident Olmsted expert, a member of the Olmsted board, you can put those questions into the Q&A section of the webinar platform. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what kind of device you're using to join us today. If you have any technical troubleshooting matters, uh, if you feel like you're having difficulty hearing us or seeing us for some reason, please put those technical matters into the chat section of the webinar that looks like a single speech bubble. I'll be keeping an eye on that and answering those inquiries real time. Once again, any content-based questions for Steve should go into the Q&A section of the webinar platform. It's now also my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, uh, to start our program. Jane? Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Steve, for coming on. But thank you, Sam, for putting this together. Um, we we are really so fortunate, Sam, to have your leadership in designing our, our scholar series, our lunch bites, and making sure that all the technical stuff works because it is so distracting when you go on a Zoom and things don't work, but you have done a wonderful job of trying to make sure that things work. So thank you, Sam. Um, we appreciate it. And I know that our listeners appreciate it as well. But today we are talking uh, with Steve Livengood. And most of you who are on this call uh, know Steve Livengood. He is the public historian for the United States Capitol Historical Society, the chief tour guide. Uh, he has been leading tours for the society for more than 25 years, but for uh, the community at large for nearly 50 years. And there is nobody who knows more about the intricacies of the United States Capitol than Steve Livengood. Today, we are kicking off our celebration of Frederick Law Olmsted. Frederick Law Olmsted was the father of landscape architecture. Uh, he designed the United States Capitol grounds, perhaps is most known for Central Park. But Steve has been serving with Olmsted 200, which is a large uh, and expansive group of folks who are celebrating the 200th anniversary of Frederick Law Olmsted's birth. And so we thought it would be important that as we kick this off, we invite Steve to say something about who is Frederick Law Olmsted and to give you an understanding of how important we think this person is. Our historical calendar, which we do every year, that identifies important things that have happened 200 years before in the history of the country is dedicated to the work of Frederick Law Olmsted. And our ornament this year is dedicated to the work of Frederick Law Olmsted. So you can see both of these um, that are available through the society and we invite you to enjoy a continuing engagement with Frederick Law Olmsted. And so now to get us on the journey of who was Frederick Law Olmsted and what is this big deal anyway, our distinguished public historian, Steve Livengood, tell us the story. Okay. Trimmer doesn't always work together with a touch screen. Um, thank you for coming this afternoon. Uh, we are celebrating the 200th uh, anniversary of Frederick Olmsted's birth uh, next year, 2022. And this is the logo of uh, Olmsted 200, which will be our, our uh, symbol for the coming year. 
Today's program uh, is sponsored not only by the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, but by the United, the National Association for Olmsted Parks uh, and Olmsted 200. Now, who is Frederick Law Olmsted? Everybody knows Frederick Law Olmsted is the father of landscape architecture. But this only begins to explain about the man because he also did the first economic study of American slavery. He set the standards of military health and world in wartime uh, during the American Civil War. He's the planner of Yosemite Park, one of the first people to, uh, to help publicize the existence of this uh, wonderful valley. Uh, he's the designer of park-like suburbs throughout the United States and set the standard for suburbs. He was a theorist of urban living and uh, designer of the greatest world's fair in history. All of these things in this one man and his career. But let's start with landscape architecture. What is it? Well, I, my, the definition I'm going on is that it is creating and organizing the entire scene as a painter does in a painting but with real plants, buildings, and objects. It's designing every element of a scene as an architect does of a building. So here's the biological fact, biographical information, born 1822, died 1903. Uh, on the left are some of the roles that I described for you. Uh, on the right are some of his major parks and, and uh, uh, accomplishments that are still around that one can see. Uh, you can see at the bottom left there, his firms of which there are several uh, in succession. Uh, and I'll talk about a little bit, have ex in existence more than 6,000 landscape plans that they did over that uh, period. And then of course, the last two things on the right, the World's Columbian Exposition, Chicago, 1892, and the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina was the last uh, landscape that he planned. But really, to understand Olmsted, you have to uh, deal with a visual. You can't really understand it verbally without seeing it. So here we have a muddy river in Boston, on the left before Olmsted and on the right after. You can see on the left, the banks of the stream are paved and bare with a dike for flood containment. Flood was a continuing problem. The stream itself is useless and conveys any silt quickly to the ocean. Wildlife would not live there. It was a dead space. On the right is the riverway. This photograph was taken in almost exactly the same location. Uh, it's part of the Emerald Necklace Park system in Boston, which we'll talk about. And uh, the experience of the scene after Olmsted is almost miraculous as you look at the left and the right here. And that really helps you understand what this man is all about. Words are not necessary to understand before and after Olmsted. It is really a spiritual experience. Among Olmsted's best known achievements are Central Park in New York. On the left is an, is a, an aerial view of the incredible contrast between this wonderful park and the teeming city on either side and in the distance and, and behind one as well in this location. Uh, on the right is the iconic view of a beautiful and peaceful bridge scene in the midst of masses of people. And uh, this is what you get right there in the middle of the hustle and bustle of what was then the largest city in the world. Here is Prospect Park. This is in Brooklyn. Brooklyn was the second largest city in the United States at that time. Uh, and it is, was in heavy competition with Manhattan. And so they decided if Manhattan had Central Park, they, they needed a park as well. So they came up with their own uh, Prospect Park here. Now, because of the success of Central Park, Olmsted did not have to contend with as many uh, competing forces in designing Prospect Park. And so he felt it was actually a better design. Uh, it didn't include so many intrusions and obstacles. So Prospect Park is considered the pure Olmsted uh, experience. Then we have 
the Emerald Necklace. This is a string of parks, some of which are homesteads and some of which he simply connected with these parkways. But he recognized that the natural um, path of the, of the rivers there and the streams made a connection amongst these parks that people should uh, have um, available as an asset. That made the water clean if you protect it and, uh, and protected the water sources for the city and for the, the um, uh, bay around there. So that is the, uh, this is his next iteration after Prospect Park is to make this string of parks to, to make a, a park system. Uh, this is the U.S. Capitol grounds. This is uh, making a park of central, of sacred space. This is one of the few designs where Olmsted had to emphasize the uh, another object that is the uh, the Capitol building, uh, and uh, and make make a proper frame for it. But it make, has made up one of Olmsted's most famous landscapes, and. It, the amazing thing is the seeming effortlessness of the design. Uh, as one visits the Capitol grounds, you don't really think about the fact that it is all an, a, um, a planned experience that Olmsted is giving you as you walk through. Um, it's carefully planned as a painter would have planned a landscape painting. It's to glorify the building rather than hiding it to make a natural landscape uh, with scenery around the periphery, so you don't get to see the building uh, as you're approaching it. You are, you are experiencing the natural world. And then he shapes and concentrates uh, and orders the traffic approach. Um, you can see in the, the just above center on either side are the, are the utility entrances, the vehicle entrances. Uh, the others are not. And so he's separating, putting the, concentrating the vehicles in those places and, uh, and allowing uh, people to, uh, and uh, uh, bicycles and those sort of vehicles to, um, uh, to have their own space, their own uh, means of transportation. Uh, he used the curb drives to intercept and guide the traffic. He had the problem there were 46 entrances and 21 streets around that square, and he had to to get people from those entrances to the, uh, the actual entrance of the Capitol building itself. Uh, so he has separated the functions as in Central Park and uh, provided gentle slopes to climb the hill. That's the purpose of that big circle at the bottom, uh, the one that, that uh, goes on either side of the Capitol. That is to gently take, and, uh, take the um, path up so that people could walk without too much effort. And he, he graded the, the, um, uh, the slope so that uh, it was easy for someone to do uh, walking. And that's, that's how he took care of the issue that it's a fairly steep uh, uh, hill there. Um, next, we have Niagara Falls and Buffalo, New York. Uh, if you look at Ni Niagara Falls, that all seems very natural, but the fact is that it is all contrived by Olmsted that when he was brought in, all of the trees were gone, all of the natural uh, approach was, was uh, obscured. There were buildings and honky tonks and, and billboards and so forth blocking the view so you could barely even see the falls. And so he was brought in to clear all of that out and, and recreate nature, and he's done a wonderful job with it. Uh, making it so that the uh, people on foot are featured uh, and, and the views are available to them. On the right is Buffalo, where he created a, a park system uh, to coordinate with the Niagara Falls. Uh, Buffalo was then one of the largest cities in the United States, and so they also wanted to compete uh, and have a, a park system like the other big cities. Then we have two more of Homestead's projects, the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina, one of his last projects. That's one of the largest buildings ever built as a, as a private home, 200 and plus rooms. Uh, and Homestead designed the landscape around, but to get the feel of it, you have to realize that there were 127,000 acres of land around that Biltmore Estate. It's now a Pisgah National Forest, but but uh, Olmsted uh, planned what would be done with that. 
Uh, in this case, he had a single owner and decision maker, uh, Mr. Vanderbilt, and a man with bottomless pockets, so he could do pretty much what, uh, what he wanted. So he created this wonderful landscape uh, right at the end of his life. And then on the right is the Chicago World's Fair, um, the World's Columbian Exposition. They did not have color photography. That is a painting that was done of the fair at that time. It was the most successful World's Fair in history. These are the major things that we identify with uh, Olmsted. Now let's do some of the standard biographical stuff. Uh, uh, Olmsted was born in Connecticut, 1822. Um, 18, uh, and so we celebrate his bicentennial next year. It was a, he was born into a wealthy merchant's family and had private schooling as a child, but an illness kept him from starting college when he was, uh, would normally have been ready. And he decided instead to ship out uh, to China in 1843 when he was 21. He went as a crewman on a ship to China. Now his family was involved in the China trade. They were merchants of uh, fine cloth. And so, and some of their um, family fortune was built on the China trade. And so uh, he had some connections and he could go with that. When he came back, uh, he hung out with his brother and the Yale friends. And that's who's in the photograph on the left. Uh, the man in the lower right is Fred looking off at another angle. Right above him is his younger brother, John Hull Olmsted, who was actually a Yale student. And the other three are, uh, men that he kept in contact with pretty much the rest of his life. So he made this circle of friends uh, and lifelong friendships with that. But he decided to become a gentleman scientific farmer in 1844. He got some land in Connecticut and then moved to Staten Island, New York, where he had his major farm. And he began to write about farming, but that's what he discovered was his uh, future was as a writer. So he, his brother and his friends were going to England and, and Europe. And so uh, Fred went along and he wrote a, a, a memoir called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Uh, and that is his first major work. Uh, and on the basis of that, some of his neighbors were putting together a newspaper, new newspaper in New York called the New York Daily Times. It is the predicate predecessor to the current New York Times, and he was among their first writers. And what they did was to hire him to, to travel anonymously through the South uh, and study the slavery economy and write about it. So he, um, he wrote what's called a, a Journey Through the Seaboard Slave States. That was successful, a, a collection of the writings, uh, the letters that he wrote back to the New York Times, and he did it again a journey in the back country through the South, and finally a journey through Texas. Those three books were then combined into a book called The Cotton Kingdom, and it was so controversial that it was published in England rather than the United States, but we know that the leaders in Britain pub, uh, purchased copies of it, they were acquainted with it, read it, and that it played a role in keeping England out of the Civil War to show them that the South did not have a future uh, with a slave economy. Then he, uh, along came Central Park. Olmsted had, did not have any more uh, such assignments, no way to support himself, and one of his friends was involved in, in uh, Central Park, and he suggested that Olmsted might make a nice supervisor of construction for the park. A uh, little background, you need to know that, that um, uh, New York City had identified partly on the basis of what was going on in England at Birkenhead Park and other parks. Uh, had decided to have a big park in the center of the city, and uh, it was being promoted and, and was assumed to be planned by uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, who was the leader arbiter, leading arbiter of taste in that era, uh, and uh, was expected to design the park himself, but he died suddenly in a steamboat disaster. And uh, he had a partner, Calvert Vox, who felt he needed uh, somebody else to team with him uh, in the competition that uh, ensued after Downing's death um, over who was gonna design the, the uh, park. And he chose Olmsted as his partner. And this uh, sets the course of the rest of Olmsted's life. The two of them came up with a very unusual plan for the par park called the Greensward Plan, in which the park would be all natural and isolated from the city and from urbanism and very welcome of everybody. 
So they begin planning Central Park and Olmsted is still, still supervising construction of it, but the Civil War broke out and they had to stop that. And, and um, uh, some of the same people that were promoting uh, Central Park uh, were involved in an organization called the United States Sanitary Commission. Uh, they were very aware of the fact that more soldiers died of disease than of battle, and that the, that the military was not prepared to deal with this, and so they decided to come up with a separate organization, uh, a private, that would uh, help ensure this, the health of the soldiers so that uh, the war was not so devastating uh, to, their, uh, to their health. This organization eventually became the American Red Cross. Uh, and so, uh, but they hired Frederick Law Olmsted on the basis of his ability to organize the construction of Central Park. They thought he's gonna be able to quickly organize uh, this um, organization they knew was badly needed. And so they hired him to become the um, uh, director of the US Sanitary Commission, which he did uh, through the beginnings of the war. He got the, the um, uh, organization all set up and, and uh, began the education of the, of the army in taking care of the soldiers, but he worked himself uh, into exhaustion. And so after the Battle of Gettysburg, when it was obvious that the North was gonna win and that the, the uh, function was ca be carried off, uh, he decided to uh, resign and go to California to try to rest. Uh, but he needed money and, and there was a company out there called Mariposa Mining that, that uh, had been mining gold and promoting gold mining. And so he went out there to be the director of that. And uh, while he was there, he discovered Yosemite Park. Now, Yosemite, Yosemite Valley was pretty well known. Uh, uh, there had been a lot of uh, uh, photographs published of it and everybody was talking about it, but it was so remote that not very, very many people were visiting it. And he's one of the first ones uh, who, who uh, went there and. Um, and uh, experience the park. And, uh, and uh, as he was doing that, of course, his mind is always working, uh, even though the mine itself was collapsing and, the, and, and uh, his position was not good. He came up with the idea of national parks, of protecting landscapes uh, from development uh, in order to preserve the beauty of the nature. He, he um, is doing the same thing that he's doing in Central Park, but this to preserve a landscape rather than to create one. So his mind is still working. He comes up with the idea of national parks. Uh, what happened was that the, the Yosemite was actually set aside by the federal government and given to the state of California uh, before John Muir came along and, and the campaign to make it a national park was uh, developed. But uh, Olmsted was already planning what, it, what should be done uh, as he was in California. But um, Calvert Vox, his former partner, had uh, noted that they, they were continuing to, uh, there was a continuing need at Central Park and he could come back for that. And that they want, that Brooklyn wanted to build Prospect Park. So, so Olmsted comes back from California uh, to uh, help develop Prospect Park and, and continue on um, uh, Central Park. But he also gets asked to look at the US Capitol grounds around this time. And that is the origin of that project that I already talked about. He also was act, asked to look at Mount Royal in Montreal uh, at Boston's Emerald Necklace. And then he moves to Boston and establishes Fairstead, which is his, uh, now his National Historic Site. But that's where his own home and office was for the rest of his life, is in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, they hire him to do Buffalo, uh, Niagara Falls and the Buffalo Parks, and to do this camp, campus plan for Stanford University. Now, by this time, Olmsted is so well established in his profession and the future is obvious to him. And he, he makes an interesting decision. That is, he had an eight-year-old son, the youngest of his children, uh, who had been named for his father-in-law, Henry Perkins uh, Olmsted. But he decides that that he's going to pass the torch to his eight-year-old son uh, in the future. Uh, and so he has him rechristened as Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Uh, 
this is an interesting signal that Olmsted is now comfortable with this, with this role and planning to spend the rest of his life at it. Um, then uh, later on, of course, he takes on the Biltmore estate. And this, this uh, painting on the left is John Singer Sargent's portrait of Frederick Law Olmsted there at the end of his life uh, as they're completing the project at, at Biltmore. And that uh, uh, painting is in the Biltmore uh, mansion today. Uh, he, uh, he also, of course, is working on the World's Columbian Exposition uh, at that time. Interestingly enough, he, uh, as his uh, mental condition declined, he was placed in the McLean Asylum in Boston, where he designed the landscape himself earlier. However, they had not followed his plans, and this was a source of distress to him for the rest of his life to be in the midst of this landscape, which was he knew the potential of, but they had not fulfilled it as he had wanted. So that's the story of Olmsted's life, but let's look now at the Chicago World's Fair. These are the people behind it. Uh, it's 1892, it's celebrating the, uh, uh, the voyage of Columbus, the 400th anniversary of the Columbus's first voyage. Daniel Burnham is the father, the leader of the, of the organization of the fair. He is a Chicago architect, probably the most prominent architect in the country, uh, credited with a lot of the development of skyscrapers in Chicago. Um, Charles McKim, the New York archi architect, is included to, uh, in the leadership, and he helps organize architects all over the country to, to contribute to this um, wonderful uh, celebration that they're having in Chicago. Frederick Law Olmsted is on the team as the landscape architect, and he actually planned the fair and much of the experience of it uh, for the ordinary people who, who came to visit the fair. Finally, Augustus St. Gaudens, the sculptor, is the other member of the team. He's in charge of the artistic aspects and getting sculptors uh, and other artists to, to uh, contribute to the fair. Um, just to give you an idea of what's going on at this time, in May of 1893, uh, Olmsted is notified that both Harvard and Yale are going to con confer honorary degrees on him. Now, of course, this is the, um, uh, this is the man who did not go to college, uh, but they have decided that he has earned his uh, advanced degrees. And so both of them uh, confer honorary degrees on him, but in typical Olmsted fashion, he accepts them in absentia because he's too busy with the Chicago Fair and the uh, completion of the Biltmore Estate. So he's not even there to receive the degrees. But he provided for the continuation and extension of his work. And this is what I touched on earlier. He succeeded in virtually cloning and improving upon himself. In an extraordinary way, he provided for his historic role to continue for a generation after his death by raising and educating his son to be his worthy successor, yet without the health-defying monomania and obsession that you find in Olmsted's personality. So let's look now at the Senate Park Commission. This is the Macmillan Commission, uh, formerly known as the Senate Park Commission. And look who is here. Daniel Burnham, the Chicago architect, is the leader just as he was at the fair. Charles McKim is the one that organized other architects and did a lot of designing of the, of the National Mall. But in Olmsted's place is Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., age 31, but already the leading landscape architect in America. And of course, Augustus St. Gaudens is involved as, as well. So to understand Rick Olmsted, you have to know about the letters that Fred, his father, wrote him as he started school at Harvard uh, many years before. He, Olmsted wrote to Rick a series of letters inquiring about his studies and his social life. In one letter, he instructed Rick to draw up a memorandum, quote, stating on honor, end quote, the times at which he went to bed each night. Now, we don't know that Rick actually did that, but imagine going off to school and your father sending you a letter to do that. His father said in another letter, I have been making a public reputation and celebrity of a certain kind, which at last has a large money value. We have, as a consequence, more business than we can manage. 
The business increases faster than we can enlarge our organization and adjust our methods to meeting it. And it is plain that this depends as yet in almost entirely on me. I want you to be prepared to be the leader of the van. Our projects take 40 years to complete and I will be leaving it to you to do so. He tells Rick, you will be around to get the credit for what I have started. You have these years at Harvard to prepare yourself. My reputation and your future depend on being adequately prepared. Imagine taking that kind of a burden off on yourself as you went off to Harvard. But Rick earned it. He became, he went to Harvard and got his degree magna cum laude. Uh, he apprenticed with Fred at both the World's Columbian Exposition and the Biltmore Estate. He becomes a member of the Harvard faculty in 1900 at the age of 30. He is the first American professor of landscape architecture and helped organize the whole profession. The next year, age 31, he joins the Macmillan Commission and helps design the National Mall, the Washington DC park system, and even suggests that Great Falls should become a park as well. He designed the National Cathedral grounds and the National Zoo. The Macmillan Commission had recommended the establishment of a National Capital Planning Commission to continue their function in overseeing the, the planning and development of Washington DC and the surrounding area and the United States Commission of Fine Arts they proposed to, to carry out the ideas for wherever federal money uh, is spent. And that includes every embassy that we build. He becomes a consultant in the National Park Service all the rest of his life, helps design Rock Creek Park, the Potomac Parks, the DC area parkway system, and even the National Seashore Study at the end of his uh, career. During all of this, he's the senior partner of Olmsted Brothers, 1895 to 1950, when he left the practice. So here are the successor firms. The Olmsted Brothers firm was, was organized with uh, uh, Rick and his uh, older brother, John Charles, and uh, uh, other members of the family later. Then, then uh, after Rick retired in 1949, became Olmsted Associates and carried on with a bunch of landscape architects, none of whom were named Olmsted. Uh, the Olmsted Sesquicentennial was organized in 1972, and that led to the Olmsted Papers Project, which went from 1975 to 2021. Um, nine volumes of papers and four supplemental volumes. We'll talk about that some more later. Uh, the Olmsted National Historic Site was established in 1979 uh, and the National Association for Olmsted Parks in 1980. And now we have the Olmsted Bicentennial in 2022. So this is the continuing um, uh, legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted. So let's spend a few minutes just talking about Olmsted design principles. I've listed them here, but we're going to go through them uh, one at a time. Uh, the first principle, and in, in many ways, the, the one that, that is central uh, to Olmsted is genius of place. This phrase comes from um, Roman origins, uh, but was used in a, in a poem by Alexander Pope that Olmsted liked. Uh, the design should take advantage of the unique characteristics of the site and even its disadvantages. The design should be developed and refined with an intimate knowledge of the site. The object of the, of the design is, is uh, to uh, glorify the place where you are. It's not to import another place and plop it down, but to show uh, what the place itself is capable of. And we see this happening uh, throughout um, Olmsted's work. Unity of composition. Uh, all the elements of the landscape design should be made subordinate to an overarching design purpose. The design should avoid decorative treatment of plantings and structures so that the landscape experience will ring organic and true. Uh, we can see that on the Capitol grounds later on, they have added uh, cherry trees and dogwood trees that blossom and, and crepe myrtles. Uh, Olmsted wouldn't have approved of that because the um, uh, because the blossoming detracts from the building and you're there to see the Capitol building, not cherry blossom. 
but this is this is uh, one of his principles: is this unity of composition, orchestration of movement. The composition should subtly direct movement through the landscape. Uh, you shouldn't be puzzled at which, which way to turn when you come to a corner. There should be a separation of ways, as in parks and parkways, for efficiency and amenity of movement and to avoid collision or the apprehension of collision between different types of traffic. Uh, he's done that on the Capitol grounds by confining vehicles to those two entrances on each side and all the other entrances are given to, um, to people walking and on bicycles and so forth. Then the orchestration of use, the composition should artfully insert a variety of uses into logical precincts, that is keep them separate. Uh, ensuring the best possible site for each use and preventing competition between uses. He wanted people to use his parks, not just look at them. Sustainable design. The design should allow for long-term maintenance and ensure the realization and perpetuation of design intent. Plant materials should thrive, be non-invasive and require little maintenance. The design should conserve the natural features of the site to the greatest extent possible and provide for the continued ecological health of the area. And finally, the comprehensive approach, that is you're supposed to take everything into consideration that you can possibly think of. The composition should be comprehensive and seek to have a healthful influence beyond its boundaries. Of course, New York City was a much healthier place because Central Park was in the middle there. And, uh, and the approach to it and ability to use it uh, was important in its design. In the same way, the design must acknowledge and take into consideration what surrounds it. It should create complementary effects. When possible, public ground should be connected by greenways and boulevards so as to extend and maximize the park spaces. Um, he was always aware of where the water was coming from and where it was going to go after it was in the park. And, that, and so that's one of the things that he's talking about uh, outside its boundaries. Now, this is Fairstead. This is the National um, Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site in Massachusetts. This was his office in his home uh, from 1883 to 1980. Uh, within this small space, they show off the possibilities of landscape architecture. There was a very natural looking gate that one came in, uh, an entrance circle, sweeping lawns, wooded walks, uh, a sunken garden, bushes, flowers, and huge elms, a, a huge elm in particular. And uh, these were all elements that could show off the possibilities uh, of landscape. Uh, I visited Fairstead several years ago, and the photo on the left is the um, is from the back corner and shows the outbuildings that were used as offices and auxiliaries while uh, the, the landscape firm was um, uh, headquartered there. On the right is the front entrance to the house with the office wing off to the right behind the trees. Uh, this um, historic site is an amazing resource. Uh, I went there a few years ago and they had a display and a program about the history of technology. Olmsted's uh, people were in the vanguard of, of using such things as typewriters and um, photographs and um, blueprints. And they saved all of, the, of their um, uh, historic items. And so you can get a whole history of technology there. Um, the site is an educational tool. The grounds have been restored to the maximum sustainable effect. Uh, they have ranger programs to, to uh, help explain it and, and enrich your, your experience. It's well worth a visit. I was amazed at how much I learned in such a short time just spending an afternoon there. It is a model to me of what a national historic site should be and a great shrine to Olmsted and the accomplishments of the firm. Now, who is Frederick Law Olmsted? That was the question we started out with. The best single quotation about Olmsted uh, comes from Daniel Burnham, who I introduced as the, 
the um, leader and director of the World's Fair, the leading architect of the era. And at a celebration of the success of the fair, uh, he said this about Frederick Law Olmsted. He credited Olmsted with having created the fair facilities and paid tribute because it was clear that Olmsted would retire after this project. Olmsted himself was not present. He was too busy working on uh, uh, down at uh, Biltmore. But Daniel Burnham said of Frederick Law Olmsted, he is an artist. He paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountain sides and ocean views. And this is where he summed up the importance of Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, but Justin Martin, the, the uh, biographer, has expressed a, a, the wider scope, in many ways a unique wider scope of Olmsted's accomplishment. No mere title could capture the breadth of his skill. He could move fluidly between art and administration, between high-flown worldviews of ideas and the practical world of men. Then uh, there's another quotation from George Templeton Strong, uh, George Templeton Strong was on the uh, U.S. Sanitary Commission and he observed Olmsted's work and observed him at work and that's what he talked about. Uh, Strong himself is a famous diarist. His diary was not discovered until the 1930s after he was dead, but it was 2,250 pages and Ken Burns made it famous as he used it in the uh, Civil War series because uh, uh, Strong was writing about everything around him and events at the time. He's the founder of the Union League Club, if you know that as, as one of the leading um, social clubs in New York City and president of the New York Philharmonic. That shows you what his position was in society. So he's looking at Olmsted. He says, Olmsted is an extraordinary fellow. Decidedly the most remarkable specimen of human nature with whom I have ever been brought into close relation talent and energy most rare, absolute purity and disinterestedness. He does have prominent defects, in particular a monomania for systems and organization. I'm not sure I would call that a defect, but nevertheless, it was Olmsted's obsession. And an appetite for power. Olmsted works like a dog all day and sits up nearly all night doesn't go home to his family for five days together, works with steady feverish intensity until four in the morning, sleeps on a sofa in his clothes and breakfasts on strong coffee and pickles. So that is a different view of Frederick Law Olmsted. But what is the big deal? I would suggest that he changed the way we think of cities. He himself said that big, big American cities are thought as settled towns, yet the population is new to its locality and so little socially rooted. He's talking about the immigrant city that he experienced in New York and in Boston. And he recognized the fact that these people were new but the, and the city was not serving their needs. He said it is possible for a man to live isolatedly from humanizing influences in those cities and with constant practice of heart hardening and taste smothering habits. This was the problem that he saw. Charles Beveridge, the editor of the Olmsted Papers says, Olmsted pursued through landscape architecture, the general improvement and civilizing of American society that he had always had in view. This was his chosen method to do what he was gonna do anyway with his life. So again, this concept can be shown best visually. I'm gonna show you a sequence of three photographs of the National Mall and show you what Olmsted's ideas did to our city. This is uh, taken around 1880 after Olmsted had completed the landscape of the Capitol. And you can see at the Capitol there with the wings on it and the dome finished and the circular walks, the curving walkways that we have today. But they end at the Capitol grounds there. And in front of us, we see the garden walks by the Smithsonian Castle right in front here, uh, which wander around without any particular purpose. Uh, you see behind those, the trains parked in the center left 
that's where the railroad station was and, and the train tracks extended out and across the mall. You can see a couple of blocks of commercial and industrial buildings on either side uh, past the train there. Uh, those blocks were not on L'Enfant's plan, but were added later. Uh, and here was uh, some fairly heavy industry right at the bottom of the Capitol. And the Botanic Garden is that white blob right in the middle below the, the Capitol there. Uh, that's Botanic Garden sitting in the center of the mall, uh, but facing away, uh, facing north, and not or oriented toward the Capitol at all. Next, we see about the 1930s. Uh, here at the mall, the buildings have been begun on the north and the south side. Uh, the old agriculture building uh, is just to the uh, lower right of the center here. Uh, and to the right of it are some other uh, old buildings. And then the two wings of the new agriculture building that is being built back to make the mall wider. And eventually that old agriculture building uh, had been slated for demolition with the completion of the new building. And they carried that out. But you can see the gardens of the agriculture department there, again, paying no attention to the fact that the Capitol uh, is in the background and the entire mall itself is blocked by trees. Here's the third one of the mall today. Off on the right, you can see the two pillars of the Eisenhower Memorial, which means that, uh, that this is a fairly recent photograph in the last few years. But this is the mall as envisioned by Frederick Law Olmsted, based on L'Enfant's plan. And, uh, and um, the way the mall was planned by the Macmillan, Macmillan Commission in its details under the oversight and consultation of Rick Olmsted carrying out what his father had envisioned. And you see a city transformed by urban planning. This is one of the great urban plans in human history of a city transformed. Uh, and cities now are now expected to be planned and organized but this shows how recently it was. Let's look back again and, and look in quick sequence at this. Uh, very little planning here and um, a little development here in the right direction and then the magnificent city that we have today. Next, Frederick Law Olmsted changed the way we think of parks. He visited, observed and studied the earlier English parks, particularly at Birkenhead near Liverpool. And then he created what is arguably the greatest, most influential public park in the world, New York Central Park. He designed it consciously so it would welcome everyone and everyone had access to it. Before Olmsted, parks were the property or gifts from rich people, uh, appreciated from afar, entered only by invitation, designed to show off the wealth and power of a few. Ordinary people, particularly the urban poor, could experience nature fresh air, quiet landscapes only in cemeteries where they went for picnicking and socializing and appreciating how different heaven would be from urban life of that era. So here's the great Central Park uh, in the midst of the urban development. No one who's experienced Central Park can ever think of parks as they were before Olmsted. Now parks are expected to be planned for their needed, not just a luxury, but a necessity for health and happiness, just like water transportation and electricity and soon uh, free public telecommunication, uh, parks should be planned as part of development. Olmsted saw parks as a system, uh, including clean water and drainage connected and based on the original landscape. This is the uh, emerald necklace again from Boston. And then um, comprehensive planning. This is the uh, plan of Washington, D.C. These are the boundaries of the, of the uh, District of Columbia today. And on the left is the plan from 1791 from L'Enfant. And you can see he's got parks there, public spaces. Uh, but later on, many of them were used for other purposes. Um, you can see Fort McNair at the tip and the lower right there. And um, uh, that is closed to public access now. And you can see there's no connection amongst them. On the right is Rick Olmsted's plan of the parks for Washington, D.C. in 1901. This is only those inside the District of Columbia, but he's connected them all and it's got big parks. He's taken, he has uh, dedicated the shorelines always to 
um, protection for the public. Uh, later on, he added parkways in several different directions, the one to Mount Vernon, the one out to Great Falls, uh, the um, uh, Suitland Parkway and the Parkway to Baltimore are all uh, Rick Olmsted's uh, additions to uh, the plans going outside Washington, D.C. Then he changed the way we think of suburbs. Uh, Charles Beveridge, the editor, said suburban villages allowed the uh, advantages of the more openly built city form and careful planning was necessary if men and women were to gain the benefits of suburb that suburban life should could offer. Uh, on the left is Riverside. This is the first suburb that Olmsted planned. It was outside Chicago. Uh, I called up the um, Google map of it to show you uh, on the right that uh, some of it at least was developed and used the curving roads. And at the bottom right, that last road is called Olmstead Road, giving him credit for that. Uh, on the left is the plan of the city of Tacoma. Well, uh, Washington State was still a territory. Uh, you can see the grid pattern arriving in the upper, uh, on the right center, uh, the grid streets uh, inter interfacing with the um, curvilinear streets that are gonna follow the topography of the area. Now, I looked up on Google and could not find this area of, of uh, uh, Tacoma, so I think it, it was not built. Uh, but on the right, you see the uh, northern tip of Washington, D.C., as planned by Rick Olmsted. On the lower right is the grid pattern that exists, uh, 16th Street coming up through the center there. And above, in the part outlined in red, you see the, st the streets following the topography. Again, I did not check that, but I know that that part of the city uh, at least followed the topography. So there you can see what he has done for cities. Finally, of course, he created the, the um, uh, professional landscape architecture. Um, Olmsted, Olmsted said. Well, while Sam and Steve are working on the video, um, I, I want to recognize that many of you have questions, um, and we we hope to get to those questions. But Steve just has so much information about Frederick Law Olmsted that um, we're going to let him finish, and and then we'll do the questions, and uh, we may extend a few a few minutes over our time to try to get some of the questions. There, he's back. Okay, the climax I want to point out is that South Korea is having a conference in 2022, October, uh, that studies Olmsted's importance and in, in park planning, including in Korea. There's a conference that, that year in China that will include programs about Olmsted's legacy as well. This shows you the scope of the man. Now, I'm going to just uh, share the screen again for a moment here and... and um, Sorry about that. Anyway, I wanted to point out some of the books about Olmsted, a couple of biographies there, and uh, a clearing in the distance, talking about his place in um, um, American history of the era. Uh, the Olmsted Papers Project has published uh, nine volumes, like the one on the left, and then these two wonderful coffee table books of his plans and views. And then um, uh, Charles Beveridge, the editor, uh, and others have published uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, Designing the American Landscape with the highlights of his work. Uh, there is a master list of the design projects listed by city and state uh, available, uh, 6,000 projects from 1857 to 1979. Designing the nation's capital is about the, the uh, National Capital Plan Planning Commission and the US Commission of Fine Arts. And then the uh, biography of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. is due out this year. Uh, beauty, efficiency, and um, an economy, the life of Frederick Law Olmsted, junior landscape architect, planner, and conservation conservationist by Elizabeth Hope Cushing. 
Okay, that's it, Jane. Do we have uh, uh, questions? We indeed have questions. Um, so I'm gonna try to put these together quickly as much as we can. Um, the, the Washington Mall, we sometimes hear L'Enfant being credited and sometimes Olmsted. How, how is that uh, put together? Well, L'Enfant had in mind the Champs-Élysées, which uh, was surrounded, uh, lined by mansions and the homes of prominent people. He did not know about public institutions that those developed really after L'Enfant's period and no one had carried out L'Enfant's plan. He wasn't even credited for much, most of his life and, and long afterwards with the success. But Fred knew about L'Enfant's role and he's the one, he was behind the idea of reviving L'Enfant's plan. And in fact, the, the Macmillan Commission was able to sell the idea of the mall to the Congress because they said it was uh, following L'Enfant's original plan. If they had just proposed it as a new thing, it probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So they both deserve credit. Now, one of the questions uh, is, did uh, Olmsted use local, uh, local plants? And then the other question is, somebody asked, did he ever design something that just did, was a dud and didn't work? Do you know anything about that? And what, what was that about? Um, well, first of all, he, he, he emphasized local plants, but in particular, he paid attention to climate. So that where there, was, uh, uh, there were plants that grew in a climate that he knew they would thrive in the locality, then he did. So on the Capitol grounds, he's prompt, uh, put a number of prominent trees called Japanese pagoda trees, which actually are from China and Korea. Uh, but he knew that they would thrive here. And so he paid attention to whether the plants would be happy or not. Uh, it's not local so much as appropriate to the climate. And then uh, did he design landscapes that were duds? Oh, yes. Um, and one can go through the, through the um, uh, master list and, and see a lot that were never carried out. And, and those, of course, we don't know whether they would have been successful or not. Uh, uh, but uh, some people felt they were duds and got rid of them. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I just got the first photographs of the, of the park in, in uh, Chicago, which has now been bulldozed for uh, the Obama Center, uh, which was an Olmsted Park and is, was considered a dud. Uh, and even though it was the site of the Chicago World's Fair, but it, that park is now, uh, has now been bulldozed for the uh, Obama Center. Question, um, did, did Frederick, did Olmsted Jr. and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright have any interaction with one another that you know about? Did they influence each other? Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright actually uh, uh, worked with Olmsted, um, probably with the Olmsted brothers uh, for at least a short period of time. So they were probably acquainted. But uh, Olmsted is mostly with the, with the previous, of course, H.H. H. Richardson, uh, and, uh, and Richard Morris Hunt, who designed Biltmore. Uh, but there's not any particular collaboration that I know of between Frank Lloyd Wright and, and uh, uh, Rick Olmsted. I'm a real Wright uh, admirer, uh, and I, I don't know that Wright ever sort of collaborated with anyone uh, when he was at his peak. Was there additional legacy beyond uh, Rick uh were there other children? You know, did there did he have children went into landscape architect or did the sort of firm sort of end with? Well, the, fir the firm land ended after Rick left. Uh, John Charles had already died, and um, uh, so there's no there's no continuation there. But I understand there are Olmsted related architects, particularly I believe in Seattle. Um, is what I've been what I've been told, but I've not looked into that issue particularly. But there are uh, any any landscape architect is going to consider themselves a successor to Frederick Law Olmsted. I think uh, he just really dominates the ori the origin of the whole profession. Got it. Um, and in the picture of the Yale friends, uh -huh. there was a woman, and somebody asked, "Who was the woman?" There was no woman. Okay. 
they're all men. All right. Well, that was some of them wore long hair <laughs> at that time, uh, but no, they're, they're all three men. Uh, Yale would not have allowed any women. I, I didn't think so, but I just, you know, yeah. respect our questioners. Um, and you, He did have some female friends and he courted some other women. But one thing I didn't get into is that his brother uh, got married and had children and then died. And Fred married his sister-in-law uh, and took care of the family all the rest of his life. So Rick Olmsted is actually um, uh, Fred's son with, um, uh, with his sister-in-law. Uh, who became his wife and took care of him all the rest of his life. So there, uh, uh, there is a, a lot of connection there, yeah. And the, the slopes of the Capitol grounds, would, would they meet today's uh, standards for the handicap, um, the ADA standards? That's yes, it's my understanding that, that the Capitol meet is compliant with ADA standards, yes. And I have seen people on wheelchairs, you know, going up the hill there. It's pretty steep, but, um, uh, but in fact, my understanding is the Capitol uh, meets ADA standards. Yeah. Um, and we are right up against our time. So I'm gonna uh, kind of give you rapid fire. Think about this. Um, you talked about, in the later part of your talk, you talked about the extension of the different parks um, and how Rick took those parks. Um, and in the early part where you talked about what were the key things um, that were really Rick's accomplishments, McMillan Park was not on that list. Is that because that was just uh, a component of the additional parks or is that uh, something that had different configuration? It's my understanding that Rick Olmsted designed McMillan Park. Uh, there are a lot of parks in Washington. I know there's a lot of uh, pressure about McMillan Park at the moment, so I'm glad to have it mentioned uh, because it, uh, it needs to be preserved. But um, uh, the whole park system in Washington is Rick's uh, in particular, and McMillan Park was part of that. Got it. All right, we're gonna give you the last last question. You showed us uh, several biographies. And uh, so for people who wanna learn more, what's your favorite Frederick Law Olmsted biography? Well, since I mentioned in it, uh, it is Genius of Place by Justin Martin, uh, but each of the biographies has a, as a viewpoint. Uh, it's hard to contain this man and his legacy in just one book, so, so um, uh, one can't understand Olmsted really without reading all of them. Uh, Clearing in the Distance um, and uh, FLO uh, are all good books and, and well, worth the, um, well worth the time to, to read them all. Well, thank you, Steve. And, and thank you to our, our, our listeners and engaged uh, audience. I know we didn't get to everybody's question. Somebody's final question was, Ulysses S. Grant, just, she just read a biography of Ulysses Grant, who also ate pickles for breakfast. Was that like a thing at that time? Well, I read that Grant biography last year, and I, I didn't remember that. I'll have to go back and look it up. It must have been. Well, there you go. Something to know. Um, it is really a joy to listen to you, Steve, and have you tell the story. And our audience is just filled with comments of thanks and we appreciate your work. We also want to talk to you about upcoming events uh, for the society. We have some very interesting things coming up. Don't forget, um, you have an opportunity to get our ornament and the catalog, the calendar so you can uh, be reminded about Frederick Law Olmsted. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to be dedicating our lunch bites to the history of congressional redistricting. Um, and so we, we look forward to that um, as we, whoops. Um, we, we, we have technical difficulty with the plans, but next week uh, we, we will have, next week we will have um, congressional redistricting um, we also have coming up um, a 
real tribute to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It's going to be the 100th anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And the Unknown Soldiers laid in state um, at the in the Capitol. And so our very own Sam Holiday, who usually you are getting instructions about how to do things, you're going to actually hear him talk about 100 years of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So for all those of you who have enjoyed Sam's welcoming, you get to actually uh, hear him talk and show his scholarship. October, November, we are going into our symposium series. We will be looking at the Gilded Age. So stay tuned. We are putting that together now. It will be in the same format that we did both the More Perfect Union series and the uh, Women's Suffrage Symposium, where they are a series over a course of several weeks um, that bring together scholars and practitioners. So we appreciate very much your support, your engagement, your following us. We look forward to hearing from you as we move forward into the fall. Thank you very much. Be well. We're glad to have you. Goodbye.